happens is, uh, can you hear me? Is this mic on? Let's see. Uh, all right. Well, it's, should we wait a second or two, or do, do you think we should just go ahead and start? Um, well, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and start here. Well, Jessie Lee Kirchival has come to, to read for us, uh, and I'm going to introduce her here briefly. Um, I thought I'd start by reading a couple of, of quotes uh, that other people have said about Jessie Lee. The Madison Capital Times has a, a great quote about her. It is through her deft, contained, and often witty touch with language that Kirchival is able to seduce us with the everyday world and then surprise us as to what riches and darkness lie both below and above the status quo. Alison Joseph has said, Kirchhoff is a poet unafraid of the universal questions of how we came to be and what we do once on this earth and in these bodies. Jesse Lee is a, the Sally Meads Hands Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, more importantly, or not more importantly, but also importantly, she directs the Wisconsin Institute of Creative Writing, which uh, each year provides a handful of writers a year to concentrate almost solely on their work. Uh, I know that Jesse Lee is a tremendous help to many young writers. And so I decided to Google um, the, the writers that Jesse Lee has helped over the years. And her former students and the, the student or the, the writers that were in the Wisconsin Institute, between them, I stopped counting after 30. Jesse Lee is a, a tremendous uh, helper of, of young writers. Um, if I actually read out the names in the books that they've published, There'd probably be little time for us to listen to her read. Uh, Jessie Lee is one of those amazing writers who seem to succeed no matter what genre they try their hand at. Not only has she published books of poetry, short stories, novels, a memoir, and a textbook, she has won awards doing it. She won the AWP short story contest for a book called The Dog Eaters. And she won the Alex Award from the American Library Association for her memoir space. If Jessie Lee stopped writing today, she would still have a body of work that would surpass all but a few of her contemporaries. And thankfully, as far as I know, she has no intention of doing this. So I'd like to introduce Jessie Lee, first of all, to read from her new book of poetry, Dog Angels. Thank you. And of course, David was one of the uh, amazing young writers I got to have at the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, so and it was a joy. Well, I'm going to um, read poems tonight, um, and um, almost all from Dog Angel, but I'll, I think I'll, I'll dip for a poem or two into a different book. Um, when this book was first taken, it was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press, and um, the woman who was in charge of the, doing the cover um, said to me, uh, oh... Um, we had this little email exchange. She said, I was thinking maybe I could use a picture of my bichon frise on the front of the book because it's called Dog Angel. And it actually has this rather scary cover on it right now. Um, and I think um, then she read the book, which was very sweet of her to do, and she emailed back and she said, no, not the bichon frise. And um, the reason was that the, the title actually comes from the poem, the very first poem in the book, and I'll read it. And you could sort of say to yourself, and you to the end, not the bichon frise. It's called Inter Mecca. Not the center of the Islamic world, but a sandwich shop across from the red brick towers of a southern university. I was 19, an English major, and every day we slouched towards this Bethlehem of lunch counters, ordered our BLTs or cheeseburgers from the black short order cook, paid the black cashier, both dressed in white like house slaves and not much better paid, though this was 1979 and civil rights marched here a decade earlier. In the far booth sat Dr. Rubenstein, famous for a book declaring God was dead. 
Now he taught courses on the Holocaust. I looked at him and thought, how can a man study Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Treblinka every day with no God to pray to and still eat tuna on whole wheat for lunch? I had no answer. I still don't. Though I have come far enough from that humid southern believer's air to doubt God's existence, it's beyond my powers to imagine the Holocaust that killed him. When I was a minister's wife, briefly and too young in rural Florida, someone shot a dog and pushed it through the window of the neighboring town's church. There had been a split in doctrine. Members marched angrily down the aisle one Sunday and out into the hot sun in their waiting cars. The dog crawled the length of the church, trailing his blood and feces down the aisle to die alone underneath the altar. Who could do that to an animal, I asked the God I prayed to then, just to show how much they hated other humans. Years after watching Dr. Rubenstein eat his tuna sandwich, a friend called to say she'd seen my book in the gift shop at the Holocaust Museum. She heard my silence, caught herself. It's not a gift shop, really, more a bookstore. But really, why should I be shocked to hear the words gift shop and holocaust in the same sentence? In French, language I was born to, souvenir means to remember. And Dr. Rubenstein, wherever you are now, I promise that I do. My daughter, struggling through the dyslexia of kindergarten, once wrote, dog loves you on an Easter card to her grandmother. Maybe that's what happened. They shot him and pushed him through the open window of his own church. God is dead, but he bled and bled and did not go easily. Next time, the angry congregants were less subtle. They set their church on fire and burned it to the ground. God, that dog angel, looking down. No beach on freeze. <laughs> I started, I probably started life as a poet. I think I wrote really wretched poetry in high school. But, um, and then when I was an undergraduate, I wrote poetry and fiction both at Florida State, which is a great writing program. But I went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, and there there's like a door that says poets and a door that says fiction writers. And you're not like even allowed to talk to each other. Maybe they're separate bathrooms. I don't know. And, um, and so I was there in fiction. And um, when I returned to writing poetry, after I had had a couple of books of of uh, my book of stories and a novel published, and I to return seriously to writing poetry. I think I was very concerned about making, writing poems that did not look at all like prose. Um, and so my first book of poems, now when I look at them, I think um, it often looks like the, 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 the world's skinniest poems, you know, like a little sheep huddled against a fence on the far side of the margins. It's not prose, it's not prose. And the poem that I just read is much sloppier on the page. and. Um, uh, I wouldn't say sloppier, but it, uh, when uh, I, heard, I read it at, at a writing conference and the poet Mark Doty asked me what it looked like on the page, and I said, it looks like a guy slumped in a chair. <laughs> but I was still afraid of the one, I think, really afraid of the one form which, you know, sort of is right there on the edge, which is the prose poem. You know, how would you know that it was a poem if it was a prose poem? And then, you know, throwing off that, that last reservation, I wrote a prose poem, which is in this book, and it is about the idea of what shape a poem should take. And it's called Not. My sister does not write poems. She uses sign language to teach deaf children in wheelchairs which color is dangerous red. If something unexpected happens, say a child who has a seizure every day doesn't, she does not rush from the room to scribble this down. If she has something to say, she calls me. In this, she takes after our mother, who likewise did not write poems, not even when she was shot in World War II by a GI sailing home on her hospital ship. He shot the chaplain too, who may or may not have been my mother's lover. The chaplain died. My mother lived to have two daughters and show them the pink scar on her back where the bullet went in, the angry purple welt over her heart where it came spinning out. Not a word on paper about any of this. Not about my sister's deaf but swiftly rolling children, or my mother's chaplain who played both pinnacle and the piano. In this, they take after my mother's mother, who couldn't read or write and so certainly never wrote a poem, though once, I am told, she castrated her husband's prize bowl with a kitchen knife and calmly promised to do the same to him unless he spent his nights at home. My mother was there. She told me this story. My sister heard it too, but she never imagined it as a poem. But then, looking this over, it is probably not one. 
Instead, it is like the family story, the one family story, that does involve the written word. How my mother once flew from Florida to visit me in Wisconsin with a styrofoam cooler of shrimp marked clearly, shrimp. On the way home, she wrote not in front of shrimp and packed her shoes in the cooler. At the airport, the ticket agent puzzled asked, what's in the cooler? Not shrimp, my mother said, and let it go at that. So think of this as a not poem. Think of me as one more not poet in a long and honorable line of not poets. And let it go at that. This is a poem I actually wrote at a poetry reading. No, nobody's sitting out there scribbling. You know, but you could be. I was sitting further back, and you know, the poet was not raised up like this, so I, I think I was hidden. It was, it was um, um, something the poet said, and the wonderful poet Lynn Emanuel, who was reading um, from her wonderful book, and then suddenly came me this idea, and I was scribbling away furiously. So um, I always feel a little guilty when I read it, but um, um, and, and, and really, I, I have to look through the book. I don't think it had anything to do with any of the things that are in this, which are diners, pie. Um, it's called Blue Plate. After the porno theater became a revival house, the neighborhood began to change. The blue plate, a designer diner opened, all aluminum and curves. Inside, the menu featured revived comfort foods, meatloaf, mashed potatoes, a glass case full of pies. Young families moved in, the drawn shades of the elderly replaced by window boxes and big wheels in the yard. Another revival. Then a Mexican restaurant, though not one run by Mexicans, and a pizza place whose specialty is a pie made with Greek, not Italian cheese, called the Fetalicious. But what is real? In time, everyone came to depend upon the diner, packed for breakfast, lunch, pie, and coffee. If you need a good plumber, go to the Blue Plate and ask for Carl, who's there talking politics with the other long-suffering followers of Trotsky. If you want a sitter, ask the waitstaff, who has a younger sister. If you're invited to a potluck, stop and buy a whole pie. In the town where I grew up, there was a diner too, Bev's, named after the cook and owner who, my mother whispered the first time we went there, was a Holocaust survivor. We went, when we went for breakfast or a hamburger, Bev would wait on us, her tattoo shining on her thick, damp wrist. She was not Jewish, but Czech and Catholic. She kept an infant of Prague by the cash register and changed his tiny satin outfits to match the seasons. But she didn't make pie, and her mashed potatoes came from the same box as my mother's. Bev's food wasn't good, only better than nothing. Just like being a death camp survivor, Bev told my mother, wasn't a good thing to be, only better than not being. My mother is dead now, Bev too. My mother wasn't a good cook either, rarely made pies. I can, but I like the ones at the blue plate better. Dutch apple, three berry, lemon with mile high meringue. The trouble with meringue, my mother once said, is that it weeps. Amazing, I thought. Sad pie. I'm going to read, um, I think, one poem out of this book. I was just telling David, this is um, a chapbook that just came out. And this lovely man, Ian Randall Wilson, published it in a series of chapbooks. And I think he's doing this like. I don't know, out of his own pocket, on his own credit card. I don't know. You can actually order this on Amazon. Um, and so I feel um, that I don't usually advertise my things like this, but I was saying, oh, I feel so guilty. I, I think he, I don't want his family thrown out into the snow and ice, although it, he lives in Venice, California, so that's probably not <laughs> going to happen. But anyway, it was just lovely. He asked for the stuff and, and then published it. And chapbooks are kind of like, um, they're kind of like not quite real books. You know, so someone does them in this limited edition and gives you some, and, and then you go around giving them out kind of like Christmas cards um, or trying to get someone to buy one on Amazon. Uh, I'm going to read. Um, somehow, the, the cold weather has reminded me of this poem, which is set in Spain. It's called Cabo de Gata, December. In vain the waves come from Africa to kiss your feet. You draw them back, always in time. You talk, I talk, no one is listening. I am choosing rocks to take home as gifts. I would cry, but the sea has enough salt. I find a rock shaped like a heart, but do not choose it. 
Who would I give it to but you? You fill your pockets with broken glass, worn by the sea to green jewels. So like you to find emeralds where I find cheap souvenirs. I notice your nose is dusted with sand, and when I brush it, you don't flinch. Maybe we will go home together. Maybe we will go on walking like this side by side, even if we are not touching. It is winter. I have never seen a beach so empty. I want to say, we could run, but where will we hide? The next one I'm going to read, um, I also do with a sense of guilt. Strange how this comes up, guilt, guilt, poems. I went um, to do um, uh, an Associated Writing Program's benefit reading, which is one of these things where you go and read, and they give the money they would have given to me to the Associated Writing Programs, which is, you know, the, it's like to say the NCAA of creative writing. Um, and somehow, whenever you go on an AWP uh, benefit reading, it always involves changing airplanes three times and spending more time in the air than it would take you to get to, like, China. And, um, and so I, I went on one, and I wrote this poem about the event, and, and the people there were really lovely, and then it was, it was actually um, on Blue Moon, which was an internet um, uh, uh, poetry magazine, and of course the person, <laughs> the person whose car I borrowed in this poem saw it, and I, I, thought, I thought, oh, I am so busted. Um, uh, but she said she actually really liked the poem, because it's called 16 Hours in Bradford, Pennsylvania, um, the place that seemed as if we were on the far side of the moon when I flew there. I'm reading this also because actually I almost never read this one out loud. It's, it's a rather longish poem in 16 hours, 16 sections. Short sections. 16 hours in Bradford, Pennsylvania. One, my host points out the Zippo factory on our way from the airport. If you have time, she says, you should go to the museum. And I nod, not admitting I didn't know, A, Zippo lighters were made in Bradford, Pennsylvania. B, Zippo lighters were still made in America. C, Zippo lighters were still made. But they are one of the two biggest industries in town. The other is the federal prison. No tours of that. <laughs> Two, Bradford, it turns out, was a boom town when the first oil rush hit America in 1870s. Men made rich just by tossing dynamite down a well and watching the black wet rip a hole in the sky. More millionaires per mile than anywhere in America. Not now. The mansions sag, their windows dark with signs, apartment for rent, for sale by owner. Though there are still pumping wells, we pass them, greasy teeter-totters. The oldest, Klein number one, my host tells me, is in the parking lot of the McDonald's. And we drive through the drive through pick up a pair of Happy Meals, just to see it. Three. You have to see the Zippo Museum, she said, and I do go there. My host lends me her car, and I drive very carefully, following her neatly penned directions. If you get lost, just stop the car and ask, she tells me. Everybody knows Zippo. Four, a clear clue where to turn. A street called Zippo Drive, lined with street lighters, giant Zippos on poles sprouting neon flames. <laughs> Five, inside the Zippo Visitors Museum is the Zippo Museum. I'm, I'm sorry, inside the Zippo Visitor Center is the Zippo Museum, where the history of 20th, 20th century America is told through the story of a cigarette lighter invented in 1932 by George S. Blaisdell and named in honor of his obsession with the word zipper. <laughs> Six, on display, the engraved silver and gold Zippo carried by George, uh, General Douglas MacArthur. On the 10-seater plane into Bradford, my sole fellow passenger was an old man in a valentine red satin jacket on the back, stitched in white um, letters as white as his hair, were the words, with the help of a few Marines, MacArthur retook the Philippines. MacArthur also had his trusty Zippo. Seven, on display, a seven by 11 foot American flag made of 3,400 red, white, and blue Zippos. Film clips of stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Donna Reed, Errol Flynn, lighting cigarettes with Zippos, also sticks of TNT. A case full of damaged Zippos, melted, flattened by what? Tanks? Hard to believe their owners survived these cataclysms. All sent back to take advantage of Zippo's lifetime guarantee. It works or we fix it free. Behind the case, a plate glass window looks into the Zippo repair clinic where skilled t technicians repair the injured Zippos at long white tables. Today, only two technicians, women, none too busy. Eight, I want to ask who carries a Zippo anymore? 
In these days of non-smoking flights, restaurants, hotel rooms, office buildings, universities, when was the last time I saw a Zippo for sale? But these are not questions to ask in the Zippo gift store, where there are hundreds of Zippos for sale. Screen printed for every sports team, every make of car or motorcycle. There are Zippos in commemorative boxes, Zippos that clip into specially designed belt buckles, fat books giving the collector's prices of old Zippos. Also a list for uses for Zippos besides lighting cigarettes, like lighting barbecue grills, birthday candles, finding your car at night in an unlit parking lot. <laughs> Nine. In the Zippo Museum, vintage posters advertise Zippos as windproof, show men holding them flaming in front of whirling store fans as astonished cl sales clerks look on. The men say, I just wanted to be sure it was a Zippo. President Kennedy was assassinated when I was six. On the news, they showed pictures of his grave in Arlington. Soon, they said to be marked by an eternal flame. Eternal flame. I imagine something mystically Catholic, like that business with the wine turning into blood and those light round crackers into the tender white of human flesh. When I visited the grave, I was stunned, the eternal flame a mere Bunsen burner, pale in the bright December sun. Now I see it was a kind of Zippo, one with a more than lifetime guarantee. 10. But in the end, what cannot be extinguished? The life of a company, a town, my life, flying out of Bradford after a day of sleet and freezing rain, praying that the ground crew remembered to de-ice the wings. See you in Pittsburgh, the co-pilot said after demonstrating how to use a simple seatbelt. And I thought, what, are you driving down to meet us? 11. Zippo. Use one to start something. Zippo. The lighter that works. Zippo. The street lighters glow their unquenchable red as we circle the town, then head over the tree-clad hills for Pittsburgh. 12. Zippo fact. If all the 300,000 Zippo lighters ever sold, and 300 million Zippo lighters ever sold were laid side by side, they would pave the streets of Bradford, Pennsylvania 1.8 times, which would certainly help with the potholes. 13. Zippo fact. 200,000 Zippo lighters were used by Americans in Vietnam, a war with 50,000 U.S. casualties. I think about this as we fly into the bank of icy clouds. 14. But the plane does not crash. Instead, it lands on time, as do my other two planes, a minor aviation miracle that teaches us again the power of prayer. 15. Pennsylvania, I tell my two-year-old when he asks where I have been. He laughs. Pennsylvania? I think of the sharp bare trees ready to write their deciduous life stories on the blank white hills. I'm kidding, I say. I went to Bradford. He nods. That's a name he can believe in. Bradford, where every zipper, Zippo comes with a lifetime guarantee, where the Zippo clinic is open for free repairs every day from 9 to 3. Zippo fact. Amount spent on repairs of Zippo lighter since 1932, not one red cent. 16. In 1952, a Zippo was taken from the belly of a fish. It lit on the first try. <laughs> Zippo fact. Eternal flame. It's not too hard on Brad. Um, one of the things I write about a lot in my poetry is my children. Um, I think that my daughter, who's 14, and my son now, who's 7, um, might forbid me to do this, but they haven't, it hasn't occurred to them yet. And, and actually, the only thing, the way it's come up is that um, my first poetry book is dedicated to my daughter, Magdalena, and she made sure that my second book was dedicated to my son, Max. She has a, a good sense of fairness about this. And um, it enabled me, among other things, to give a signed copy of it to my son's kindergarten teacher uh, by way of a you know, bribe. Uh, and uh, I'm going to read a couple stories, a couple poems about my children. I, I notice I do write about my children and not my husband. The name, my husband's name is like never mentioned in any of these books because he would know better. Uh, this one, these actually are also set in Spain. In the gardens of the Alcazar. This is what the guidebook said. The extensive gardens, fish ponds, fountains, flowers, orange trees, topiary, are among the most beautiful in Andalusia. Isabel and Ferdinand once received Columbus there. This is what I thought in January in Cordoba. We should go inside the palace before it really starts to rain. This is what was there. 
water. In pools, in spurts, in curls, running downstairs, cleverly constructed to take it from here to there. My son, too, went running after. Water, he said, water. My daughter, ten, forgetting she was bored, ran faster than her brother. The sun came out. Oranges shone like the small hot stars they are. My children, blonde on blonde, glowed brighter or as bright or brighter. I don't remember topiary unless you count trees cleverly shaped like trees. I stood at the bottom of a waterfall of ponds, as slow in my winter coat as the koi suspended in the water, and watched my children cascading toward me, pool to pool, fountain to performing fountain. We are the water, my daughter called, her arms high in the air. I knew that, is what I thought, and stood quite still, a dreaming fish, waiting for the water. This is um, the only thing that my son Max remembers about the trip to Spain, which was when he was two. And so the title of it is What Max, Age Two, Remembers About Spain. The Cave. Also, big churches, but mostly the cave. The boy, also named Max, also waiting to see the cave. The other Max's father joking in German that maybe there were cave pigs. There were no pigs, there was a bat. In 1905, a farmer looking for guano for fertilizer discovered the cave and so found something richer than bat dung, tourists. The old man who owns the cave, who unlocked the iron door, who let the Maxes in, who lit the lantern so we could see, who locked the door behind us. The drawings on the walls, deer, mountains, a pregnant horse, more deer. I'm sorry, did I say the, did I say the drawings on the walls? I'll do it again. The drawings on the walls, deer, mountains, a pregnant horse, more deer. Black and red and yellow. Also calendars, black hash marks on the wall like those made by prisoners counting down their days. In the deepest cave, a big sea fish, though the Mediterranean is 50 kilometers away across the jagged peaks of the Serrania d'Aranda. And inside the big fish, a small fish, then a smaller fish, then the smallest fish of all. That's me, says Max, pointing to the smallest one. Max, a fish inside his father's arms, inside a cave, inside a mountain in the south of Spain, on the earth, in our solar system, in a galaxy some astronomer with a sense of humor or of metaphor named the Milky Way. That day in Spain, a hash mark on a dark cave wall, a sooty moment on the calendar where we stand bathed in lantern light in that infinite balloon of time we insist on calling now. In the cave, Max says, even day is night. When I was at Iowa, and I wasn't supposed to be talking to the poets, I did actually get to take one poetry workshop uh, with uh, poet Jerry Stern, Gerald Stern, and um, who's an amazing, wild character, right? sort of I don't know, it's the Yiddish earth spirit. And um, I'm, you know, I'm normally kind of a shy little person. I was saying, could I take your workshop? Could I please take your workshop? And he's going, no, no, no. And so I flung myself onto the floor uh, outside his office and began rolling around and pulling at my clothes, <laughs> which was exactly the right thing to do. And he let me in. And um, and one of the things he told me, um, because then I was, I was, you know, I was having trouble with not being so relentlessly narrative, being weirder as one is, should be in poems. Um, at least some of the time, and so he told me to, to write down my dreams and to write dream poems. And I often make my students do this, and I don't let them out of it if they don't remember their dreams, because I say, well, get somebody else to tell you their dream, and you can write that dream poem. <laughs> we're, all, we're all connected through the, the great unconscious. Um, and this is, um, he had another dream poem that I've written, so thanks to Jerry Stern. I dream my children are giving me a final exam. They sit on a window bench, swinging their feet, Magda, eight, has her violin perched on her shoulder. Max, a mere year, toys with his pacifier, stares out the window. The exam is my life, and they don't like my answers. Max points out the window. A shadow is passing. Duck, he says. Bird, his sister corrects him. They both turn to me, blue eyes big as planets. Sparrow, I say, but I'm wrong. I'm going to take a break for a minute from that book and read a couple from um, my first book. Um, there's a sequence at the beginning of this book that's about a, a dear friend of mine, um, actually the other Jerry Stern, Jerome Stern, who was one of my first writing teachers at Florida State, 
um, and it's about um, it's getting ill and and and, and dying. Um, and I um, don't read these very often because of that. But um, I was thinking of him just the other day. Um, he he's uh, the author of um, a ma book, Making Shapely Fiction, which um, I have a lot of the MFAs who teach at my school were using this year, and I, I was reminded of him. Uh, and so I'm going to read a couple of these poems. Um, the first one's called Ham in the Moon. Sit down and I'll feed you. Ladle up a bowl of lentil soup, a little ocean full of sun and warmth. Add a salad made of peppers hot as fallen stars, avocados, olives, just a touch of lemon juice and garlic. I am not a world-class cook, but for you, my friend, I will stay up all night sweating in my kitchen to bring the cuisine of eleven nations to your plate by morning. You are sick and you will die, the doctors say, but I refuse to let it be from starvation. So here, straight from the south, green beans cooked all day and my finest crab cakes, each fork, each taste a reason to keep living. For dessert, cherries so ripe, they whisper carpe diem, or would if cherries knew much Latin. After such a dinner, we can wipe our mouths clean of crumbs and of regret. Because I do not kid myself, I know the future, that iron door will be there waiting, no matter what I have baking in the oven. But in the meantime, there are ears of sweet corn and a mother load of mussels it is clear God made especially for steaming. Take a seat at my table and I'll cook them up for you. This one's called The Last Poem. The morning of the day you die, I close my eyes, try prayer in place of sleep, but slowly my body floats as yours must on your drugs. I am washing out to sea and you are there. Together we tumble up and over far away until we land the sand a faintly warm surprise. If this were all a dream, we could fish this salted water, look up and see only birds in white, blue sky, then the birds again. See the harmless moon, a jellyfish, which like death has lost its sting. But here the dreaming ends, prayer ends. The shadow is coming closer, block by block, the blade which severs everything. Your hand slips from mine, your one good eye which looked and looked is slowly closing too. Wake up, I want to say, don't be hasty. We can rearrange your trip. Let someone else take the U-Haul, the ticket, this cup from your lips. And I have never kissed you except on the forehead. Oh God, death is here, right inside this room. I won't look, I won't look, then I do. I'm going to read the last poem in this book. Which is about a historical event which is fairly obscure. And just to go to show that we're all connected by some deep subconscious level, my colleague at, at, um, at uh, uh, Wisconsin, Quant, the poet Quan Berry, Amy Quan Berry, actually wrote <laughs> a poem about the same incident and has it in one of her books. Um, it actually takes place outside Boston, so she claims that you know she has the first rights to it because she's actually from the North Shore of Boston. Um, uh, but I have to say, this is just very strange because if anybody else in this room has heard of this historical incident, I will be stunned and surprised. It's called The Great Molasses Flood. 1919, a four million gallon tank burst open and scalding sugar poured down the street, smashing houses, twisting L tracks, carrying people and horses down to the harbor where dirty water, as well as molasses, filled their open mouths. One man had his sister, nine, swept from his arms, was only saved himself because he wrapped his arms around the Virgin Mary and refused to let her go. I read this story in the newspaper on the 70th anniversary of the disaster, then clipped the article and put it somewhere I thought I could always find it. Now I want to know, where exactly was that flood? And where's that clipping? My daughter, Magdalena, is nine, the age of the sister lost forever to molasses. When Magdalena is sad, she cries and says she misses Daddy Lance, her great-grandfather who died age 100 when she was only four. She met him once, a nearly blind old man who shouted, girl, come closer. She wouldn't let him near her, wouldn't let him touch her with his ropey, shaking hands. 
So how to explain her grief? I imagine her taking inventory. Mother, father, brother, who is missing? Daddy Lance, what is missing? The love only he could give. What is she really missing? Infanthood with its wet bond of nursing the squeeze box of my womb, God. I know this sounds crazy, but sometimes I swear I can feel God inside me. I just have to think about it, feel around inside my body as if my soul were a tongue searching in my mouth, and there, there, that rough filling in the back molar, there he is, a foreign presence grown too familiar to notice every day. My mother used to say I was slower than molasses moving uphill in January. So though I know the molasses pouring from that tank sped through the town like an express train bearing down on a drunk, when I imagine it, the molasses is moving very, very slowly. Still, even after 80 years, the people, the houses cannot escape their hot confectionery fate. Imagine a slow brown wall coming to get you, to drown you in sweetness. Imagine one moving slowly towards us all. When my daughter was little, she used to say, we should save the clothes she'd outgrown so I could wear them when I was a baby again, or when she was a baby again. Time flowing backward, forward, tide, pond, clock life. Daddy Lance, a baby again, imagine. The molasses flowing towards us, and then, just when the smell is too sweet to bear, moving backward, pouring up into the air, back into the wooden tank that held it, the boards flying into place, the town below it golden in a marzipan of calm. Always both moments, the drowning, the not drowning, Daddy Lance, bald baby, balder, old blind man. Do I believe it? I don't know. I'm the one whose tongue finds God inside my dental work, who has a daughter who, when she learned that everyone who lives must die, said, oh well, I didn't want to be born either, and that turned out okay. <laughs> Imagine the sweet smell of molasses. I could take some questions. I could call on people, because I'm a teacher and I know how to do that. <laughs> we rustle up a couple of questions. Okay. You started out writing fiction, mm -hmm. and when did you make the shift to writing poetry? Well, as I said, when I was an undergraduate, I had written, I had taken poetry workshops and written poetry um, as well, and, and did have the one poetry workshop where I was in Iowa, but um, uh, I, I, I felt I was like a secret poet, you know, I didn't tell people that I was writing poetry when I was, um, when you become a professor, there's this awful thing where your colleagues have to read all your work and judge it every year, and I was like, mm, not the poetry. <laughs> so, um... And then after I got um, my novel taken, I had the book of stories published, and I got my novel taken, which in, again, sort of academic ease meant I got tenure, which is, yes, a job for life. And then I thought, okay, now I'm going to write poetry. And I just sort of took off and got back into it. And at first, what I think the reason I moved from genre to genre, I mean, having written fiction and nonfiction and poetry, is because I like to do what really scares me. Um, and, for example, something that seems sort of obvious because they call it the same genre, but it, it was really scary to move from writing short stories, which you really usually write in a workshop and everybody's kind of holding your hand or no, they're not holding your hand, they're at least yelling at you, they're giving you some kind of attention. Um, and you do that in this workshop setting and then you graduate and my, you know, my turn in a thesis, which is mostly like my first book of stories. And, um, and then you're like out in the real world and you start writing a novel and there's like nobody to tell you the difference between a novel and a story or nobody for me. And you find out like, like even your best friend, like even your husband, will only read it like once, <laughs> you know, it's, I've changed a few pages, would you like to read the whole thing again? Um, and so that was really scary to learn to write a novel, and, um, and my first novel's set in Paris in 1929, and all kinds of other difficult things about it. Um, and so, um, and then when I started writing poems, it was really scary, because I felt like I could, I could close my eyes and sort of just like feel, I just instinctively know what a short story was, and I didn't know what a poem was. And I think that's, you know, every poet, this is the curse of contemporary poetry, that, that the question is always, you know, what is a poem? And all the poetry words are about that. And each poet sort of has to find out, you know, what the poem is for them. And, um, and it still probably scares me more than, um, than writing fiction. And, and, I, and I find that the interesting thing about it. Um, and so now I would say that I'm much more a poet in my last two books in the chapbook are, are, are poetry, and I read mostly poetry. And so I, I, I begin to think that I, you know, I, I don't know, I've, I've come out. I've, I've, I was a poet all along and now I found out. But um, I don't think that's true. I think I'll, I'll, I'll get restless and, and probably switch back and, and do, do more prose. Um, uh, but right now, poetry is what really interests me. 
Someone has to have a question on one of those genres. Yeah, you know, it seems like what you do is you sit there and say, is that an idea for a poem or a story or a novel? And that doesn't really happen to me. Um, the poems just seem to come out of a different place. Um, um, they tend to happen, it's, been, it's also been really a learning experience for me about the different ways to write. It makes me have more tolerance for my students who you know, tend to have a variety of ways. The poems come out without thinking about them in their first drafts. Um, so I, and the best time to write them is when my, my brain is disengaged a little, like late at night or early in the morning, um, and, um, um, or when I'm sitting, <laughs> sitting at a poetry reading. Um, and and they, they, the, the, the voice just comes to me. And somehow, there, there may be things I've thought about, some emotion that I'm thinking about or a trip that I've been on, but suddenly it just crystallizes and it comes there. I'm, now I'm talking about the first draft. I mean, uh, but um, and and in fiction, I'm much more controlling. Um, I, I used to say when I was younger, and my mind was sharper, that I would walk around and really and have a story worked out. You know, like sort of could just like recite it from beginning to end. I would sort of know everything that was going to happen in the story before I would write it. Um, I think that that that's not entirely true because now I, I forget things. And the other is that a novel is actually too big for me to hold, hold in my head. You know, a whole book of prose is like, oop, you just kind of drop all the balls. And um, So you, I start out still, though, more controlling. I think I know where the piece is at least going to end if it changes along the way. And I, I find you just, I can't write a poem that way. Um, the, the nearest thing I could say where there's been an overlap between what I write in, in poetry and in prose is that um, my memoir, which was actually in some ways a huge shift for me because um, as a fiction writer, unlike many young fiction writers, I wasn't an autobiographical fiction writer. Um, that's the novel set in Paris in 1929. Um, I'm not that old. Um, but And so I had all these stories about growing up in Florida near Cape Kennedy, which is um, during the, the uh, moon race. Um, in your, in your average suburban dysfunctional family with two dachshunds, and, um, which are a sign of dysfunction. Um, <laughs> my husband would tell you. Uh, and I, I had all these stories, and I sometimes told the more humorous anecdotes at dinner parties, and people would say, why hadn't you ever written about that? And the reason I didn't want to write about that is because I was just a born liar. That's what fiction writers are. I just wanted to make stuff up and escape my own life. But I began writing about my life in the poetry, and even though there are not poems about that, they're not poems about growing up in Florida, they're poems about things like uh, my friend's cancer, um, or about um, my children being born, it kind of was me rehearsing for being more confessional. And it seems safer in poetry, because you know what? None of my relatives read it. You know, it's never going to be on the checkout stand at the grocery store, like a story that came out in Good Housekeeping I got, I got busted on by my mother-in-law. Um, is that me, she said? Is that really unpleasant woman, me? <laughs> um, and so it felt sort of private, and that allowed me to write my memoir, I think also believing that no one would read it, which turned out not to be true. <laughs> People did read it, including, well, my ex-husband, for example, who called me up, but didn't sue me. Um, so, you know, so in, in some ways that was, the poetry was, was breaking into a new emotional territory for me, but there were not poems where, you know, here's the poem about the space launch, and here's the chapter in the book about the space launch. Um, and how I do it, separate it out, it's sometimes I just, I just write one or the other usually at a given time. I'm like, I'm on this poetry streak now. It's the longest poetry streak I've been on. But another way in, in the past would have been that I'd be writing poetry for a while, um, and almost like I was warming up my brain, and then I would launch into a longer fiction or, or, or prose project. Um, so. um, can you describe your, your revision process of your poems? How long does it take you to, to know this? I, I tend to need somebody else's eye sometimes. I've been, um, I'm, I'm not in a, uh, a fiction workshop, and I don't really have a, a prose workshop. I'm kind of short of people to share my prose work with. I actually should confess, I'm, I'm working on a novel now, and I said I'm, I'm not uh, doing prose now, but I had started one, and I, I actually showed it to my agent for feedback, which is probably not the best thing to do, because they can say, okay, like, how is this commercial? What ways can we make it more commercial? But, I mean, she's a good judge of things. I, I just tend not to, to seek people's outside opinion on my fiction, which, you know, may be a weakness on my part. Um, I know lots and lots of fiction writers, but I've been in a poetry workshop for, since 1994, which is about the time my novel came out and I started writing seriously poetry again. So there are um, now eight people in it, eight women, and we meet every other week. 
And what that means, um, and I think this is a civilian workshop, you know, because I, I'm, I'm a teacher. I, I get paid to teach workshops, and I, that would be great if I could take one of those, but I can't because I, I teach in the program. So this is a civilian workshop. And, um, and what it means is I have to write a poem every two weeks, you know, because you just don't show up without something. You're embarrassed. And um, so it means that I wouldn't have written these poems without being in that group. And they also give me that kind of feedback that's really hard for me to see, which is um, this, like, so does not make sense. Um, I can't, you know, I, I just, there's... I don't know what's going on until the third stanza kind of things, um, and help me sort of trim things down. And so that's helpful, and I get different comments from all of them, you know, they talk about it for half an hour, 45 minutes, and it makes a really long night with eight poems. Um, but we have snacks. Um, uh, but and then, then I, I usually let it sit for a little bit, and then I kind of go back and look at it again. And so some poems are just really drastically revised. I mean, I'd be shocked to look back at the original. I, I, poems are the only thing I ever write longhand. I mean, when I used to start writing fiction, I wrote it on a typewriter, and I've always written fiction on a computer. But I, I, you know, so I have you know, yellow pads, and if I look back on the first version, something handwritten would be really different, and then I save different versions of the computer, and they'd be different. And so even a poem that I think came out pretty much as is would have a lot of trimming. And one of the classic things for me is having to cut off the beginning because I'm just kind of spinning my wheels. And it's, I say that to students all the time, but it's true with me too. Um, and, um, and to tighten things up. And sometimes I, I, I think I have a fiction writer tendency to over-end poems. <laughs> so I cut the ends off sometimes. Um, and so, so yeah, so it, it takes a little while, but it's, it's always... A, Revising a poem to me is again different than fiction. Fiction I love to revise. I mean, when you get a story or a novel to the place where you're just doing revision, it's like, I don't know, it's like the part where you've cleaned your house and now you're just like putting flowers and vases and putting the cookies out and waiting for the guests to arrive. It's, it's the fun part. Um, and to me, poetry is kind of painful to revise. And I, I do it kind of like, you know, I hold the pruning shears and go, Snip. I don't know, I don't know. Um, um, so, but I do make myself do it, of course, because otherwise they wouldn't be any good. One more? Yeah. Well, you, you oh. are. Oh. Same question. Also. Yeah, this one back there. Oh, okay. um, you talked about that you're reading mostly poetry, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, are there any particular poets? Oh, it's one of those questions, the minute someone asks me, my mind goes blank. I, I, I set myself on this project, which I made this this list. I've been handing it out to people because people ask for it, but I have like a 57-page list of things I was making myself read. This is not, a, I'm not laughing, it's really 57 pages. And it, I, I felt I had never had a really good, um, you know, uh, modern through contemporary reading class. I'd never really had a, someone who would say, okay, well, now we're doing the... Um, uh, the Harlem Renaissance, and now we're doing, um, you know, the images, and now we're doing so. I actually set myself on this program of reading. You know, let's 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 start with uh, well, start with start with Whitman, <laughs> work up, um, and um, and so I, I just just finished that. I mean, as much as one can finish, I guess I read. I still haven't read all of Ezra Pound, but um, you know, I sort of sat down and I read um, people that I had not wanted to read before, and discovered some enormous enthusiasms along the way, like. Um, that um, that I had previously not really appreciated. Um, um, I like Frost a lot better now. I like Emily Dickinson a lot better now. I'm a big Whitman person. We had some arguments in my department between me being the Whitman person, big long lines, and my colleague Ron Wallace being the Dickinson person. Little tiny ones. Um, um, I um, oh, there were just lots of people along the way. I, Nina Loy. I don't know if you know. Um, um, uh, I um, uh, I found out I. Don't like Wallace Stevens still, <laughs> um, um, but you know. So I, I went through this, and then now I, I've actually just been reading. Um, so having 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 gone through that, reading more contemporary things, um, and I'll pick up a book and just really love it. I was I was reading some James Tate, some uh, Tom Lux recently, um, um, I, uh, some Denise DeHamel, um, and they're just lots of amazing and wonderful things. And one of the things I like to do is um, check, do you know Poetry Daily, you know, the website? So I, I like to go on Poetry Daily and then um, you know, listen to a poem every day. And then um, I, um, you know, if I like that person, I'll, I'll go order the book, I'll go look for more stuff. And I keep trying to keep up with the new books especially. And also because more and more stuff is coming into translation. I'm really, I'm really a, a big fan, especially of French poetry, which is the only poems I could read sort of in the French and in the translation. Um, and just trying to, you know, to keep up with things. Um, and so for the first time, I really feel like I, I sort of understand, you know, it's kind of like hand over hand up a rope, you know, which poet came before, which poet who influenced what poet, who knew which poet, who slept with so-and-so's wife, you know, the whole sort of, the whole sort of train of, of the way poets are all connected together. Um, and that was, 
just enormously helpful to me. I mean, I don't think you need, obviously don't need to do, know that before you with, before you write all that before you know, write a poem, or I couldn't have written the previous two books. But um, it was a, it was a good project for me. And if you, if you want the fifty seven page list, I would email it to you. It's annotated. Did, did you have one? Um, your, your novel that you're working on. Mm -hmm. um, Well, it came out of my next book of poems um, is the first book of poems that I ever wrote intending it to be a book of poems. Um, again, uh, uh, I always with the yin and yang of my colleague Ron Wallace, so he likes Emily Dickinson when I like Walt Whitman. He, he, he not only knows what's going to be in his next book of poems, he knows what the title is going to be and what color the cover is going to be. <laughs> and me, I just write poems and at some point you know, I'm down on the floor you know, spreading them out on the carpet seeing whether there's a book there um, with the first two books. And, um, and then this book of poems that I'm working on now, which is called Cinema Muto, which is Italian for silent film, is um, based on the silent film conference that I go to in Italy every year. And where they show, um, for 10 days, pretty much around the clock, they show silent films, old silent films, restored silent films from all over the world. And um, I started writing poems about them. And, and now I've written what clearly is my statutory limit of silent movie poems. <laughs> I've written, oh, I don't know, 120 pages of silent movie poems, but although not all of them are only about, you know, less than half of that are going in the book. And so I, I've written a book that I believe will follow, it follows the, an imaginary festival. I mean, the one that's 10 days long, even though I managed to cram, you know, five years worth of poems in there, um, and has things about my life and about what's going on with me, both in the poems when I'm watching the movies and telling about the movies and as separate poems. And so that really feels like, wow, I've written a book of poems that's you know, a whole thing. But then, just because I obviously had more to say about silent poem movies than, you know, than could be contained within the form, I, I burst out and I wrote a novel um, that um, is based on the life of a, a guy I became obsessed with. He's a silent film star named Ivan Mushukin, who was the biggest silent film star, the biggest, one of the biggest film stars in, in the world at one point. He was um, the most famous silent movie star in Russia before the revolution. And then he came out into France and was just a huge international star in France until 1929 um, when sound came in. And he was, you know, it's like Rudolf Valentino, like someone just a huge star. And now he's just completely obscure. I mean, even most silent movie people would not necessarily know who he is. And none of his film is available on DVD or on video, except in bad bootleg forms. Um, and you have to go either to, I saw them all at this film festival, or go to the, um, to the, uh, uh, the, the archives in, in Paris that have his films. But anyway, so I, I just became obsessed with him. Somehow I just, first of all, he's, he's incredibly handsome. But um, I, he came to me to represent to me everything that was brave about being an artist. I mean, he, he um, it was more than you wanted about Ivan Mishukin, but he um, was raised to be a lawyer in a wealthy family, and he just got off the train on the way back to law school and became an actor. And then he went to film, and when the revolution came, he went to France, and he just is just fearless in pursuing his art. There are downsides to this. For example, he has a lot of illegitimate children <laughs> spread along the way, which is what my novel's about. And also, he just hits the wall in the end. He, when sound comes in, it's not just that he doesn't have a good voice. He's a French film actor who doesn't speak French. Right? He can't go back to Russia and make films. Like, they cut his head off, right? Um, he's a white Russian. He can't go back. And so what he does is he drinks a lot, and then he dies of a pauper in 1936. He's buried in an unmarked grave. And um, and so you know that part I would like to miss. You know <laughs> I'd like to be the I, I was using him to inspire myself in being brave about my art. You know never be afraid was his motto. And so um, but I would like to avoid the you know the unmarked grave part and also the lots of illegitimate children. Um, <laughs> but I've written a novel that involves the idea that he doesn't actually die in 1936. You know inspired by the idea that um, Christopher Marlowe is really William Shakespeare and didn't really get stabbed in the eye in that tavern. I think, well, why didn't you just fake his death in 1936 to get out from under all this debt? You know, and he goes on and lives and ends up having my main character, who's his illegitimate daughter. Um, so um, I was able to raise him from the grave and, um, and have a novel set now, because I wanted to avoid having yet another novel set in 1929 in, in Paris. Well, this one's set in Paris now. Um, but I, I was tired of all the research. Like, you know, how did they take baths in 1929? You know? How did the toilets work in 1929? I wanted to avoid all that again. So um, this one's contemporary, and it turns out that he's lived a really long time because he's 114. <laughs> Good Russian stock. But anyway, I, I still have a lot of a revision to do on that one. So I, don't, don't, you know, don't be rushing to your bookstores anytime soon. But it'll have a great cover because he, he has the most amazing silent movie eyes. You know, the thing in silent film because you can't talk is people have these like laser eyes. And so I just I want to have the book, you know. 
the reason I want to finish the novel and have it published is so I can have a picture of him on the cover. But of course, they'll probably defeat me and put somebody else's picture on the cover. But I could just, I, I have all these pictures of him that are just really amazing. So. Okay, you guys have been great. I, I think they have books over there. Uh, I'll go over there, and if anybody wants to ask me questions, you feel free to come over. Is that what I should do? Okay. Yes, thank you.